starts as a vision. A machine that defines its own category and coins the American term pony car. You build American legend Mustang. They build Mustangs plain, fancy, or just plain fast. The newest top of the line car is more than just a pony car. Think racehorse. It's got 650 horsepower. It's the world's most powerful production V8. And all are built here, inside Ford's Mustang Mega Factory. It's dawn in Detroit, the Motor City. A place where they've always gotten up early to head to the plants to build American cars. The way I view it is we're curators of a legend, right? So you've got this almost 50-year history of Mustangs. It's a North American built car on around the globe. But the car is all Detroit. A city that came close to going bust. But now, it's bouncing back. Through it all, the Ford Mustang is one of the true survivors. You know, I've been here over 25 years with the plant. It's a very family-oriented. People work together as a team. Everybody's really tight. Everybody watches for each other. I don't know if the other plants are like that. In 2009, the workers and plant were put to the test. When the economy was bad and, uh, you know, the big three and four, you know, was going through their little tough times, it was a little shaky at times. Well, we didn't know if we were going to stay open. We did not know if we were going to have jobs. They talked about closing the doors here. With the world economy on the ropes, the Mustang is one of the cars that helps keep Ford in business. And everyone up and down the pay scale pitched in. Way if UAW members had to step in to help with some of our wages and benefits that we had to take a step back to move forward in the future. And uh, it seemed to be paying off, you know, with the uh, economy slowly rising. It's something they're proud of. Mustang coming here saved us. We're very thankful and grateful for our jobs. It's allowed us to put our children through college and, and it's given us a good future. And that commitment is reflected in the car they build. It does feel good to build a pony. It feels good to build the only real sports car in Florida. A sports car built inside Ford's Flint Rock assembly plant, where a tight clan of nearly 1,700 people come to work. And every day, they build 680 Mustangs. Machines that combine old school values with high tech manufacturing. The Mustang is amazing because this is a car that's simple. It's a simple, affordable car. There's a gas sipping V6 that gets 13 kilometers per liter on the highway. The Mustang GT, the base V8 model. Or the race-ready Boss 302, with a 5-litre V8 you can take to the racetrack. Right off the showroom floor. 
Ask people at the factory which is the nastiest Mustang in the barn. And the odds are, you'll get just one answer. Favourite Mustang, it's gotta be the Shelby. Look at it! Look at the curves on it! Look at the colour! The Shelby GT500, the biggest, baddest, most powerful Mustang Ford has ever built. The speed of the car is 321 kilometers an hour. This car's secret is its new 5.8 liter supercharged V8 engine. It's got 650 horsepower, 200 miles an hour, which is, which is hallowed ground in the world of sports cars. <laughs> but with a base price of just over 42,000 euros, it's hallowed ground that's more affordable than most supercars. Many others go for speed by taking weight away, emphasizing a light car, using expensive parts made of carbon fiber. Mustang keeps costs down by using steel, but strive for their kick by adding raw engine power. We've been able to make this car do things and go places in terms of performance that a Mustang has never been before. But when Mustang designers and engineers want a car to break the 321 kilometer an hour barrier, they face a whole new batch of challenges. Not only do you have to get the engine to survive it and to make enough power and have brakes to deal with it, you have to have a body that doesn't try to take off off the ground, and then you have to stop the car when you're done. From every single angle, this poor car is being attacked by the earth and the laws of physics. To keep the Shelby firmly on the ground at 321 kilometers an hour, requires engineers who understand that speed demands stability. You also have to engineer from an aerodynamics and stability, right? That car has to stay planted to the ground. We pay a lot of attention to work with our teams very, very closely for aerodynamics. The faster you go, you need to balance the lift front and rear. We spent a lot of time working to develop shapes on the front end that would keep the front end planted and balance out with the spoiler in the rear to keep the rear end planted as well. So 200 miles an hour, it increases the stability of the car. They build all the different Mustangs in the same factory at the same time. It's mass production as an intricate industrial dance. They build the car in four different models with three of the four available as convertibles. It's a huge production challenge with almost more options and variations than you can count. I couldn't even tell you the number of combinations of Mustangs that we've built. It's got to be in the hundreds of thousands. Probably the most complicated part of the entire process is developing the process, breaking the assembly process down into elements that can be done repeatedly at high quality all the time. The Mustang factory is designed to be highly efficient. It needs to be. The manufacturing of an automobile has more orchestration in it than manufacturing of any other product in the world. It's amazing how it all comes together at the end. Orchestration that takes place in a complex maze of more than 276,000 square meters. That includes a stamping facility, a body shop, a paint shop, several sub-assembly areas, 11 different lines for final assembly, a 
and one ginormous parts warehouse. Just getting the right parts to the right place on the line is a considerable challenge. There's a total of about 4,000 part numbers, and about 3,500 of those part numbers go on the car in final assembly. So they all need to move through here in one form or another. The Mustang plant is relatively small. However, that allows us a lot of efficiencies, getting the parts here, getting everything done on time. So it's compact, but extremely efficient. Hundreds of thousands of people coordinating together everything from the thickness of the metal to where the hole is supposed to be to how the operator interacts with the parts. And if we do it right at the end when you turn that key, that beautiful vroom. <laughs> uh, A lot goes into making <laughs> every Mustang look like a Mustang. It all starts with these giant coils of steel. Coil of steel weighs 20 tons or 40,000 pounds. And we use that to make the various body panels. We'll uncoil the steel, cut it into blanks, and then begin to stamp the body panels out. From that one roll, weighing more than 18,000 kilograms, they'll make the body parts for 35 Mustangs. The hood, the fenders, the doors, the roof, the deck lids, the quarter panels, and quite a few of the underbody components. Stamping those parts is the first step in making an unmistakable Mustang. Portions are number one in car design. They're absolutely important for Mustang. What makes a Mustang is the long hood, which is a must-have. We've then got to go to a really, really tight cabin and a shorter deck on the rear. And that silhouette is the iconic look of Mustang. Once the body panels have all been stamped, they're sent to the body shop. It's a real ballet of robots. The robots may look like brutish, powerful machines, but they perform their jobs with a certain delicacy. Shop here, that state-of-the-art technology is made shop, able to paint whatever colors we want on whatever models we want. Here, they use everything from high-tech robots to ostrich feathers to prep and paint a Mustang. Mustang factory has the most modern paint line of any Ford factory in the world. To manage it all, they monitor everything on the paint line from a computerized central control room. The heart of the paint shop, basically, it controls everything in the shop itself, from the conveyors to the lifters to the robots. Primer, you're going to start in one minute, copy. The paint shop itself has 27 miles of conveyor in it. It has over 100 drive units for the conveyors and over 109 robots. So there's a lot of equipment out there to maintain and watch over. Some of the robots use laser vision cameras to position themselves. The 
precision on these robots is a little wider than a human hair. Others spin out paint at incredible speeds. 45,000 revolutions a minute. Sometimes when I'm driving down the road and I'll see a car, I think to myself, hey, our team painted that. It gives you a good feeling. It's a good feeling shared by many and a story that begins at the 1964 World's Fair in New York. The night before the Mustang goes on sale, Ford runs TV commercials for the car at 9.30 p.m. on all three American broadcast networks. Out of the Ford Pavilion, there's a daydream corner called Mustang. People swarm into dealerships the next morning, and by the end of the day, 22,000 Mustangs are ordered. Mustang has been around a long time. It started the pony car era in America. The Mustang was an instant success. It's right up there with Levi's and all of the iconic American brands, and there's a few of them that have gone on uninterrupted. Be straightforward, I'll have a pie car, I'll, I'll guts. Guts that, in part, come from a multi-generational workforce. My dad actually worked in Ford Motor Company in design, so I'm a second generation designer here at Ford Motor Company. Well, my father was involved in the early Mustang. He was a Mustang enthusiast. Well, I guess I come by it naturally. My mom likes to relay the story that I started drawing cars in, in Sunday school. We had an assignment to draw Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and I drew Adam and Eve in a car. And the first thing anyone sees is a paint job that takes about 10 hours. The process starts by running each new car through a very special car wash. It cleans the oils and the dirts off the vehicle in order to make the paint stick to it. Then, another bath. This one is to help keep the paint job uniform. It's just a big tub of paint, basically, but it is electrically charged, so it allows the paint to stick to the vehicle. Then they use a very special dusting tool to wipe down the car. That's a feather duster. It uses ostrich feathers to clean off the vehicle. On the other side is where we apply the primer to the vehicle. We apply it to the interior inside the vehicle and the doors, and we apply it on the exterior of the car. They put sealer on all the places in the car where different pieces of metal are welded together. Most of the work is still being done by robots. With the help of a very special camera. They're SELA robots. They use laser vision camera and a regular camera to find locations on the body to give the robot the area and location to where to put the sealer on the vehicle. But the robots can't do it all. The sealing process also needs a human touch. The people to my right basically are finessing the sealer on the vehicle. Uh, they make sure that it's in properly. They brush it, they spatula it, and they put it in its correct position. They also seal the bottom of the car against sound. Basically applied by the robot in specific areas that the engineers have told us that that's where the noise comes through the car. Finally, it's time to paint the car. We're in the top coat booth right now. Behind me, the base coat is being applied to the car, which is the color for the car. Positive and negative electrical charges bond the paint to the car. 
the paint coming out the end of the gun is charged. It has a positive charge to it. It's attracted to the car. The car is grounded through the conveyor. Again, as modern as the paint line is, the robots need some human help. This is not fully automated. It almost is. The robots can't always get all of the paint where it's supposed to be on the cars. So we have manual sprayers, two in each booth, that cut in those areas that the robots can't get. To be efficient, they use the same spray booth to paint the car and then protect the paint. Basically, in this booth, you get your color, which is the base coat, and then you get your clear coat. The clear coat protects the base coat from the sun and from the weather and just about anything else Mother Nature could throw at you. When you see the car being sprayed, not all of the paint makes it to the car. A lot of it goes down through what we call grading here, and there's water underneath that. They call the extra paint mixed with water sludge. It gets dried out and recycled. Last stop on the paint line is quality control check. A chance for a final touch-up if one's needed. Overhead, conveyor belts move the newly painted body to the final assembly area. We're at station one in trim and final, and this is where the Mustang comes out of the paint department and comes into the final assembly area. They start with the exterior trim. And nothing is more important than putting the universally recognized logo on each car. This logo is what Mustang is all about. This is the only car we do in Ford Motor Company that does not have a Ford badge on it. It has horses on it. Everybody knows it's unmistakably a Ford, but we don't need to say that. So many companies struggle with names, and they try to come up with these names and cool stuff. You get one that works, and you stick to it. We all know exactly what it is. Done. End of story. Not quite the end of the story. The Mustang logo means many things. The Mustang nameplate is known around the world. It's the most customized vehicle in the world. And it also is the only nameplate that has been in production for 50 consecutive years. The low logo is a powerful commercial symbol, but the power that counts is still to come. Several stations install key parts that many people take for granted. This is part of the underbody install for the plumbing, the fuel lines, the brake lines. And we do that on what's called the tilt line. And that allows the vehicle to be tilted up at an angle so if the operator has full access to the underbody of the car. They take the doors off every car. The doors go to another line to be finished off glass, electrical, and all the trim installed. And that door will go back on that Mustang at the end of the process. Believe it or not, the door is one of the most complicated and difficult parts to build. The door is a relatively complicated piece because of all the mechanical pieces inside, the latches, the mechanisms, and the glass. There are 537 different parts for each door. How do they know? One day, they simply counted up all the pieces. We had to do a complete breakdown of all the parts at every one of the stations. And that's every single nut, every single bolt, washer, screw, grommet, everything that's coming in.
The hardest job on the door line has nothing to do with nuts, bolts, or washes. Part of the most complicated thing is the glass jig, making sure that it sets the Mustang glass correctly into the door. Workers get help from a special jig with an unusual name. Yeah, they call it the beast. <laughs> Yeah, that jig here adjusts the inboard, outboard of the glass on a Mustang, every Mustang here. Well, it's so dang big, throwing that thing around all day will give you a good workout. The windshield and rear window are a bit easier to install. They use a laser measuring device for precise positioning and just the right amount of sealant to hold the glass in place. The windshield is dry by the time we get to the end of the process. From here, it's probably about another six or seven hours. Windshield is fully cured and ready to dry. Nobody is waiting for the windshields to dry. Yeah, if you look at the line behind us, you're going to see one vehicle going by us just less than every minute. So that's 68 units in an hour. That's what we do for a living. Mass production of automobiles. Mass production in a high-tech factory that produces 680 new Mustangs every day. Many of the Mustang's parts are built as sub-assemblies. It's another way to save time in the factory. One of the most critical sub-assemblies is the dashboard. Right now we're heading into the instrument panel assembly line. This is where we build up the dashboards and all the accessories for the Mustang instrument cluster. The Mustang dashboard includes wire harnesses, the heating and air conditioning system, ductwork, airbags, electrical modules, trim pieces, so quite a bit goes into it. Other parts are made right at the plant from scratch. They make the Mustang's front and rear plastic bumpers in a large injection mold right on the factory floor. Big mold, big mold. A mold that squeezes the bumpers into shape. More than 15,000 kilograms of pressure. It injects and it's still molding as it, as it injects, it cools. And after it cools, it sets up in the tool before the tool opens, the unloader takes it away. Workers use a blowtorch to remove any excess plastic left around the edges. Then they send the bumpers off to get painted by yet another robot. Then a human outfits each bumper with additional parts. These are your side covers. The center grill. It's a lower air dam. You have to pay attention to detail when inserting it for a proper fit. Twenty-five percent of the cars that leave here, I had something to do with it. That's a beautiful feeling. Once they're done sub-assembling the bumper, 
they go straight to the line and get installed. We put in the uh, fascia on the Mustang, the taillights, uh, shock absorbers, uh, some of the wiring, harness, a lot of stuff that you don't see. A few lines over, they work on four different engines, a V6, and three different V8s. This is where the engine and transmission are assembled together. From here, all the accessories will be put on the engine, and after that, the engine will be installed in the vehicle. Once the engine and transmission are mated together, it's time to build the drivetrain. They start by installing suspension pieces. Engine mounts. And then lowering the power plant into place. Front shocks and disc brakes go on next. Then exhaust pipes. Finally, it's time to put some horses into the pony. They install the engine, transmission and front suspension from underneath the car. Personally, I like when the body comes down on top of the underbody and suspension and engine. So I can sit there and just watch that all day long. That's the first time it really becomes a full vehicle. A full vehicle that only a badass could have created. Whether it's squealing its tires on a burnout. Or the sound of a 650 horsepower V8 being fired up. That big, mean sounding V8 roar. A trademark of the car. You know, that sound, that exhaust noise, that burble, that rumble. It's the classic American V8 noise. And that modern high-tech engine gets installed thanks to two basic metal bars. If you notice, there's two steel bars at the front of the engine hoist, and they plug into locating holes in the body to make sure that the engine's positioned correctly for installation. These are custom-made tools for the process. And there are literally dozens of them throughout the plant. They're very process specific. Process specific. Another way to maximize efficiency. And the workers play a major role in helping to do that. The tools that we use to process aids are developed primarily by the operators who have to use them to make their jobs easier. If they have an idea to make things better, we always listen to them. More than in most car companies, those who build the Mustang describe their co-workers as family. Atta boy! 
I, I work with these guys more than I see my wife. I'm here 10 hours a day, so they're like brothers and sisters to you. Some of the workers here really are family. Kim Vandenberg is a team leader on the engine line. <laughs> she met her husband, John, here. We've been married 20 years, and it's amazing. My best friend works here, my husband works here. We're like a family. I said I'd never work with my wife. But I met her here, and I had the wrong idea. It's been a, a great thing. Twenty years later, the married couple built a very special Mustang together. It was a very special client. Their son. My son is a police officer in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and he waited his whole life to order a new car, and he ordered a V8 manual Mustang, and we got to build that Mustang. She got to follow it, do different things that most people don't. They called me over to let me uh, start it up, hear that rumble for the first time. So I got to tell him that I started it before he did. So that was pretty cool. Mom left her mark too. If you look under the valve cover gaskets, there's a little message that she wrote. She wrote, made with love and all that. It's not typical. But Dad was not going to be outdone. So he signed the engine too. There seems to be a hidden side to the Mustang. It's a car that some people consider well, romantic. Mustang's chief engineer. It's true, yeah. I, my boss at the time who had a Mustang, I asked him if I could borrow his car because I wanted to propose to my wife. And so I drove it to Chicago where she was and picked her up. And then I drove her to the uh, high school where we met. And I stopped in front of the classroom that I actually met her in. And I told her there was something wrong with the car. And of course she believed me and I got out and I opened up her door and I knelt down on me and I asked her to marry me in a Mustang. It's absolutely a love affair with this machine. To this day, they talk about the romance of the Mustang at the factory. A love affair that begins when they fill up a new Mustang with gas and start her up for the very first time. We're at my favorite place in the Mustang plant. This is where the hard work of thousands of people and thousands of parts all come together and we start the Mustang for the first time. It's where the horses come alive. Grown-ups who have an unusual opportunity to work as professionals and feel like kids. It's a bunch of guys who want to do what every teenager in America wants to do, right? Go really fast. We get the opportunity to engineer it and do it, so yeah, we're in a great place. I said, hell yeah, let's get it done. You know, Dave develops a product, we have the responsibility to build it. When they come up with a real cool idea, we're very enthusiastic about getting it done. Once a Mustang becomes a living, breathing beast, a worker drives it to a final test and quality control area. They do an electrical inspection. They check the lights. Horn, turn signals, instruments, and the heating and air conditioning systems. What I'll do is I'll browse over the car and see if there's anything I can notice. As I just did, I can see that there's a little polish repair that needs to be done. So I add a little polish, grab my wheel. Wipe her off, and there you go, you have a new car now. Then they drive the car onto what they call the rolling road to check the output of the engine.
now the Mustang is ready for the real world and a real road. Surprise, Arizona is a small desert town about 35 kilometers northwest of Phoenix. This is where Ford pushes their Mustangs to the limit. Something the public never gets to see. The proving grounds are private property and Ford takes its security serious. It's like an old-fashioned western shootout. Except this time, it's not a fast draw. It's a fast car. So we take our latest and greatest machines and we put them to the test to make sure that the way that we've designed them, that they actually perform to the specifications of targeting. Sometimes, the cars don't meet their targets. Surprise Arizona proves an appropriate name for testing the GT500. It was getting so fast on road courses that we were hitting its speed limiter of 155 miles an hour. We ended up deciding, let's just take the speed limiter off. When we did that, we found, wow, this thing, this thing's capable of 200 miles an hour. Nice surprise, but the fun's not over yet. Here comes the Boss 302. First, they warm up the tires. Oh, tire pump. Absolutely. That's the first thing you do in a Mustang is you dump the clutch and you just do a huge burnout. You laugh and you say, okay, I'll take it. Track staff monitor the action from the control tower. No car can enter or leave any part of the track without permission. Jim, I have you off the track. Boss 302, you're clear for high-speed runs on the track. So we've just started the Boss 302. We're going to take off here. So I'm on the throttle. The wheels are spinning in the back there. More importantly, the car hooks up really fast, grabs that road, and just propels us forward. That's what's the magic of the Boss 302, is that you can hook up all 444 horses right to the ground. For car people, hook up means maximum traction between the tires and the ground. Which helps Mustangs hit full speed across Ford's version of the open range. We got a straightaway, we're going to do high speed testing in a straight line. We've got a loading handling course, which is what we're on right now. We also have some rough road surfaces that we can go take the cars on to really put the suspension to the test. Tom, you're clear for the high speed track in the uh, red Shelby. In reality, tests at the track are hard work. There's always the potential for danger. But in these modern pony cars, it's also a lot of fun. When you're building a badass hot rod, you've got to test it the way some buyers may drive it. Even if it might violate highway rules or the factory warranty. When you drop that clutch and you take off, everything comes to life. I mean, the car is, it is roaring, the engine's roaring, you get the feel through the steering wheel, and the car's just absolutely launching. It almost feels like you should be calling NASA to get clearance to, to launch the uh, space shuttle or something. The Mustang isn't just about power and looks. It's also a symbol for the survival of an entire industry. We take great care and great pride in producing every single Mustang that we build. Our Mustang team is, is, is a bunch of car crazy uh, fanatics that absolutely love this car and love this project and would kill to work on it. 